we've known each other for a long time, probably long like time. seven, eight years. Best seven, eight years ever. Yeah. Oh, you're so sweet. <laughs> I adore you. So we have talked about so many things and it's funny because, you know, I'll, I'll get comments on old videos and yeah to bring it back up. And so this is where this question came from. So over the years, we've talked about, let me get this. We've talked about food energetics. We've talked about um, the circadian rhythm. We've talked about, um, what is it? Oh, you know, variety. You and Karen are very big on variety. And it's funny because all of that has shaped all of these discussions have shaped how I feed my dogs. And when we, like, when we talked about the circadian rhythm, I was just sort of like, that's not possible for people who work full time. But now that I work from home, that was like the first change I made was feeding my dogs within a block of time on a daily basis. So today, after writing this book and given everything that you've learned over the years, what do you think out of those three is most important? Gosh, uh, you know, that's such an awesome question because I could tell you a different phases in my life. I favored one more than the other. So if I could go back in a time machine, when I first started feeding, you know, when I first started getting into, Hey, what's going to be really good in my dog's bowls, you know, like what could be the ideal nutrition, um, which is still always going to be debatable. It was always what my dogs ate. So that was always really important to me, right? Like what goes into that bowl. And that's really important. Like, I mean, what you, what you choose for foods you know, what the quality of that food, where that food comes from, whether that food's ultra processed, whether that food's fresh, hugely important, no question, right? Then it comes to how much you eat. So then as I started to get into more research, right, you could put the best foods in the world in that bowl. But if you're overfeeding, Mm -hmm. you're going to have a lot of problems on your hands, right? Because you talk to anybody, obesity is life shortening doesn't matter who it is, right? Like that's, so you're spending copious amounts of money and you're overloading that bowl um, and you're shortening your dog's lifespan because of it. So, you know, overeating. So how much one eats is, I started to say to myself, my gosh, you look at some of these caloric restriction studies and then you have somebody who's feeding like the best food in the world and somebody's feeding meh, an okay bowl, but they're feeding less of it. So the dogs are still getting the same amount of nutrition, but less calories on one end. Mm-hmm. And those dogs are living those other dogs, right? Yeah. So it really makes you wonder. So then how much and what you eat are very important. Well, then I get on a plane, I go to the Salk Institute. I sit with Dr. Sachin Panda and the team that, you know, that won the Nobel prize for circadian rhythm. And they turn around and they say, listen, I know like, like what you eat and how much you eat are very important, but did you ever think about when you eat? Mm -hmm. Because when you eat, we believe as scientists is even more important than both of those. And it was like, what are you talking about? What do you mean (laughs) when you eat is even more like, that's crazy talk. Like what, like explain that to me when you eat, it's kind of my new favorite topic. I don't know. Like I, all three are so important. Like you really can't yeah. break away from all three because it'll get you. But if you can, if you can try to get a blend of all, I was floored to see, you know, one, gosh, I wonder if I have it here on my phone <clears throat> as I pull up my phone during an interview, <laughs> I, I have a photo that Dr. Sachin Panda sent me and it, it floored me and I'm going to put it up to the screen and we'll probably either going to see it or we're not going to see it or it's going to work out or it's not going to work out to my favor. Look, my phone even won't turn right now. I'm just trying to get the damn image to turn. Here we go. So this is going to be really hard to see, but this is talking about three identical meals before my cell phone kicks out. I'll tap it. So it's saying if you ate breakfast, lunch, and dinner, three identical meals, right? Mm -hmm. Right here on this side, this little chart right here, this is these, this is what's called glucose response to the identical meals. Look at the spikes in blood sugars. If you eat the exact same meal at like eight o'clock in the morning, Eh, small, small glucose spike. You eat that exact same meal at around like two or three o'clock, higher glucose spike. Look what happens at around eight or nine o'clock when you eat that identical meal, how high that glucose spike is, right? Like you're eating the exact same food. You're eating the exact same portion, but because of the time of day, when you or your dog are consuming that food, you're getting a higher glucose spike. Mm -hmm. And I'm not going to get into the disadvantages of glucose spike. I think a lot of people probably are already well aware that you're trying not to get your blood sugars to escalate so high, but according to these researchers, you could have the best bowl in the world, Kimberly, the best bowl of the world. And it becomes junk food. If you eat it too late at night, later on in the day, like, because then it hurts your body 
versus nourishes your body. Mm -hmm. It's actually better to go to bed on an empty stomach on that night because your body will do more magic than trying to jam like this nutrition that you might think that you're missing out on at around 10 o'clock at night. So I think they're all three have an equal, have an equal importance in blend. You know, it's not just time of day either. The, I will say this, there was a brand new study that was just published and I've got it up here on my screen so I don't mess it up, but it's in the Journal of Pineal Research, okay? This study like literally came out January the 18th. Light exposure one hour before bedtime suppresses melatonin levels in preschool children by as much as 98%. Melatonin is a hormone that helps us fall asleep. Man, lights, I tried posting about this. People aren't ready. <laughs> People aren't ready. I like people were not ready for me talking about like light bulbs and keeping your lights on and flaring I, light. People are not ready for that. That is, I that remember. is, that's 2035 talk. So in 2035, I'm going to try to repost about it. I think <laughs> closer, like, you know what I mean? I think they're, I think their mind space will be closer, not the majority of people, but some people, but I was like, people were freaking out. They're like, are you really talking to me about light bulbs right now? Is that where we're at right now? I remember because I looked at that and I'm like, I don't even know how to respond to this. I don't even know what I would do. Are we supposed to now go back to candles? I don't know. But I do know my friend got me um, this gift for Black History Month. I like to get gifts. (laughs) And so she sends me a gift every year and she got me, it's a dinosaur light and it's different dinosaurs and they light up. And so I had it on and it w- it was, I, even though all the lights were out, I thought it would be like a night light. Yes. It lit up the room <laughs> and no. I was up all night. Even after I turned it up, I was, and this oh, was last no. night. I was like, oh, I'm getting no. a good night's sleep because I am yeah. interviewing Rodney in the morning. Yes. I'm not a morning person. I went to sleep at about 3 30 in the morning the worst I was just what I would and I wasn't stressing I was I was just laying there like a wow, light I'm just because of a light yeah I, just because of a light hey, <laughs> listen I had no idea it, so uh, Dr. Nico Kubini right now who's an incredible canine cognition scientist you should like bring her on your podcast like th- she's the most incredible one I mean the studies that are coming out of this woman are phenomenal but they're studying and researching what are called sleep spikes and I was like what the heck's a sleep spike right and, like it's like literally they'll put like these you know, the little sticker with the wire that you see in like those in like science movies, like on dogs, right? Analyzing dogs, sleeping patterns, human sleeping patterns. You need to produce a certain amount of melatonin from like, hypothetically speaking, like from 7 p.m. until like, let's say 3 p.m. And if you produce enough melatonin in your melatonin gas tank, you will have the best night's sleep ever. You ever know those sleeps where you put your head down on the pillow and you open your eyes and you look and it's like, it was like 10 p.m. and now it's 7 a.m. and you're like- Oh my God, like I didn't even move all night. You have like the (laughs) best sleep in the world and you function like a rock star all day. And then you have those sleeps where you, you know, you had, I had that last slice of pizza at like 9 PM and that last glass of wine. And I got up 15 times during the night and I had the worst sleep of my life because when you put food in your mouth, you suppress melatonin. When you look at lights, blue blaring lights, it tells the melanopsin receptors in your eyes, stop producing melatonin. And then that gas tank only gets half full and you have the worst sleep of your life, right? Sleep is so critical. So, and how does sleep tie into food? Because just like what we said, you eat food, you will disrupt melatonin and you will disrupt the sleeping pattern. You can shorten the lifespan of your dog, according to scientists, and you can increase chronic diseases. you got a dog with arthritis, a senior dog at home, flaming arthritis in their body. And you've got all the lights blaring on at night and you're watching TV and you've got bright screens on and whatever, and your dog's laying beside you, you can actually increase the, pra- the like the amount of pain your dog is going through, according to science, with just lights or and or food at the wrong time of day. Yeah. And here I, I just walk around turning off lights because I'm the daughter of a boomer who was like, we don't own stock in, you know, I can't remember what the um, utility company was in Portland, but, um, but that was, she would say all the time, we don't own stock in PP and whatever. So now I just walk around the house turning out lights. <laughs> Listen, never invite Dr. Karen Becker to your home. She came here to help me write the forever dog book. She changed all the light bulbs in my house. Like everything. Okay. So that's just it is what did she change them to? Because so, everything is so. So yeah, so Dr. Actually Sachin Panda, right? Wrote the book on circadian rhythm. He has a free app and they measure it by what's called Lux, L-U-X, Lux of light. I'm not the guy to talk about light research. <laughs> like if a light scientist is probably watching this and they're not even called light scientists, I have no idea what the hell they're called. <laughs> they're probably like just 
spit on the screen right now and say, why is this guy talking about something he doesn't know about? But from what I learned from Dr. Sachin Panda, the amount of light that's streaming into your eyes. So like, you know, we see those people now that wear those like blue blockers yeah. to block out blue. So apparently in the daytime, when you open the curtains, you're trying to get as much blue light into your eyes as possible. So you're up, so you're chipper and you're moving around, right? Blue light wakes you up. As it starts to get late at night, as it like, you know, like, I'm not sure in, in like in Seattle, like what happens with light over there, but here in Nova Scotia, it gets dark at like 3 p.m. when it's at the winter time. So like everybody starts to get tired, like, cause at 3 p.m., 3.30, you're like, why am I so damn tired, right? <laughs> it's because the blue light's fading, right? It starts to fade. You start to get those amber hues. They say like evolutionary, like cavemen with flames, like the color of light, the orange, it starts to tell your eyes as the blue disappears in the melanopsin receptors, your body starts producing more melatonin, right? So when you have those LEDs in your home, which I do because I like to film, I have like the 5K, the 5,000K lights, those bright blue, mm-hmm. kind of like garage lights, man, those will disrupt melatonin like no one's business. If you want to stay up, turn those lights on because that blue light will tell your body not to produce any melatonin. So Karen would come in and she would change all the light bulbs to 40 watt light bulbs, but hey, not, hey, shoots. but not like 40 watt light bulbs with blue, with a red hue. And in fact, you can keep getting lower. You can come down to like 2,700 K when you're buying bulbs, even lower than 2,700 K. Now there's 2000 K bulbs that are so red, but you will have the best sleep. Dr. Sachin Panda told me that he only has 40 watt light bulbs in his home and they're all like a soft color light at night in the daytime he's blaring the blue lights it's it's a lot and i think it's too much for the casual pet parent yeah but i think the 2.0 pet parents like okay there's something here i'm not sure what it is but the more studies that come out like the one that i just read to you one hour of light suppresses 98 percent of melatonin release in preschool children kids that are looking at cell phones apple knows about it that's why on your apple phone at night you get a change of hue on the color of your phone it goes mm-hmm. from blue to orange because it's removing the blue light. So you don't struggle to try to sleep at night. Oh, nice. Well, this is good. That's good information to know. Cause it's like, for me, I look at every single thing that you guys put out as just like, oh, that's interesting. Kind of like, you know, when you're talking to a friend and they tell you something, it doesn't mean that I need to overhaul my life, but yeah, the light bulb one, cause I was what I shared it over on my page. And so many people were saying, what was it? The, is it the, what do we have now? Is it the incandescent bulbs that we used to have? Yes. And then we switched to LEDs. Yes. And I, and people were saying you can't get incandescent bulbs anymore. And I was like, that's not true. That can't yeah. possibly be true. So <laughs> yeah, I yeah, went yeah. to the store. I went to two stores, yes. not one in sight. So it's, that's a really good point because first of all, remember the spiral ones, the blue ones, remember the yeah. spirally blue ones, we we're all changing. You can't buy those anymore. You go mm-hmm. looking in stores, they're not there anymore because scientists realize, oh, shit. You, there, there's blue light, a lot of blue light being emitted from those were disrupting. In fact, it actually will hinder learning abilities in children. So they're in schools now, they're modifying the mm-hmm. lights in schools, in NASA and spaceships, they're modifying the light in spaceships, because it also affects your learning behavior. Um, that said, those bulbs, those incandescent bulbs, yeah, they're really hard to find. You're right, 100%. So what they're doing now with the LEDs is they're toning those things down. Like they're rather than being 5,000 K or 6,000 K. So there's like a blue, like, again, I'm not a light scientist, but there's like a, (laughs) like a scale when you're buying your bulb. So on one end, it's like super white, super blue. And on the other end, it's like super yellow. And people don't like that yellow look because if you're filming, especially if you're a content creator, everything goes yellow. It's like atrocious. I have that problem here in this room when I turn on like the lights because Dr. Becker changed all my lights. It just turns into like a yellow orange. Look, watch. I'll show you. Look how it gets orange in here. <laughs> oh, yes. Right? Do you see that? Yes. Right? That's because Karen has switched them to <laughs> so we you get better sleep. And then when you get better sleep, you're yeah. sharper, you make better videos. You're more, you're ready to go. Your energy levels are better. Um, and in the daytime, I have a lot of natural, a lot of natural light. That's why it's blue in here, right? Because mm-hmm. I got so many windows. That's a natural light. Nice, nice. All right. So um, you and Karen have talked a lot about um, just basically how important it is for, I have, I have a Husky next to me and I was yeah. petting him under the table and I pulled my yes. hand up and I had Husky hair. 
Look at that. It's just everywhere. I got a, I got a little one, little husky over there that every single time I touch it, husky. I got husky hair everywhere. I know. In this house. Yes. I mean, it's just I know. Like, it's a, I did not. And he's a husky mix. And it's just like, yes. good Lord. Yes. Uh, okay. So, <laughs> so you guys talk a lot about, you know, making sure basically when we're choosing a food for our dogs, yeah. you know, like many diets out there are not a hundred percent complete. They're not necessarily right. meeting our dogs. Um, nutritional right. needs, you know, specifically even with DIY and that's to be understood, but talking about commercial raw, yeah, that's something that with so many raw brands hitting the market and I'm seeing yeah. it and I'm, it's, it's exciting because, you know, eight years ago, you know, this None was, this was a struggle to talk yes. to people. Yes. Whereas today it's like, I'm, there's a, com you know, farmer's dog has commercials yes. now. And yes. it's just like, and I did, I saw one raw food commercial a couple of years ago, but, yes. um, but it's just like, it's starting to get, you know, people are starting to hear about this. Yes. So when it comes in, I got this question actually from a follower a couple of days ago, and she was just so overwhelmed. She's feeding commercial raw. Yeah. She's doing variety to make sure her dogs are getting just basically different ingredients. She's going to different brands, which I love, but her question was, how does she should she focus on brands that follow AFCO standards yeah. or should she focus on brands that follow NRC or is there some yeah. other determination to know that her dog is getting what her dog needs? Yeah. That's, you know, that is such an awesome question. Like maybe in the top five questions I get asked of all time history. Right. And I've learned so much over the course of just living in a different country. Because if I think if I lived in the United States, I would not have um, the love-hate relationship I would have for like AFCO, let's say the American Association yeah. of Feed Control Officials, than I do then when I live in Canada. So it's incredible that we're seeing a boom, right? And I know that I went from being the guy who would hold up my sword and say, feed your dog as much fresh food as possible and feed your dog raw and, or lightly cooked, whatever, it doesn't matter, but just try to stay away from ultra processed foods. And then all those raw food companies would then take my picture and my memes and quote me. And we love you. We love you. We love you. And then I started to see what was happening with not all these companies, but a lot of these companies where these were like incredible ma and paws, but just didn't really understand the basics of animal nutrition, let's say. Mm -hmm. And some of these diets would have like two ingredients, like just like meat and bone. Some wouldn't even have organ in it or, and so on and so forth. And others would have like multiple ingredients and so on and so forth. But everybody had a recipe that they had a philosophy around that they believe was the best recipe in the entire world. Mm -hmm. And for a pet parent, that's a daunting task. Like you walk into a shop and you talk to the owner, the owner's not going to say, Hey man, like my food is like semi okay. Like I don't got everything in there. I know Jerry down the road, he's got more stuff and it's way more balanced than my food, but it doesn't happen. Everyone will tell you, here's what wolves ate and everyone will use the wolf excuse, right? Yeah. Here's what wolves ate in the past, right? Forget that dogs have been like domesticated for like over 15,000 years, right? Like just ignore that. <laughs> but your baby wolf at home that you're feeding, um, his great, 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 great grandparents, you know, they ate beef, right? Like they took down cows apparently all the time in the wild. And that's all they need is beef. So that's it. And I'm teasing a lot, <laughs> but when you don't have standards, so I think the biggest daunting task for the pet parent is it shouldn't be the pet parent's responsibility to have to worry if the food is balanced or not. It really should. Like when you're, when you're supporting that manufacturer and you're giving him a dollar, that's his frigging job to know whether he's met nutrient requirements, right? I know that, you know, you've got AFCO, you've got the NRC here in Canada. A lot of people will, will base it upon the NRC in the United States. People base it on AFCO in Europe. They base it on FEDIF, right? Whatever, whatever. When it, when a, when a, when somebody's going to sell you food, and you go up to them and you're like, Mr. Jones, can you please show me that your diet can at least meet standards? That's when you're having a good conversation. Mm -hmm. What's happening is, Kimberly, with all these new companies that are starting up, they can't even meet standards. Like how many years did you used to watch me and Susan Thixton with like pitchforks saying, AFCO's 
minimums are so minimum, <laughs> right? And yes. for people that don't know what AFCO is, it's like, those are the people that will tell you like, like all the vitamins and all the minerals and like the minimums that your dog or cats need for life function, mm -hmm. right? So they're the minimums. And we would argue with our pitchforks to that company, to that organization and be like, your minimums are too low and this is garbage and so on and so forth. But then you come to Canada where there's no AFCO and you start feeding raw and, or these fresh food companies, and they can't even meet 50% of the standards. So those standards that we argued that were like the lowest ever, they can't even meet 50% of like, how can you make it so deficient? But they're like, but it's raw. So it's the best. Yeah. You said raw is the best. So it's the best. Yeah. Right. Forget that it's not balanced. You said raw is the best. So this is the best. And pet parents become so hyper, like so ultra confused because you walk in, it, the term raw is such a loose term that you could walk into a store and the guy down the road is 99 cents and the guy that down the road, a pound and the guys up the road is $4 a pound, but you don't ask questions why you just hear the word raw and you just assume he's a ripoff. So I'll go to the guy that's 99 cents. Okay. So what do you do as a pet parent? I think that the bet at this moment, depending on where you live in the world, this can be very challenging. Um, there's incredible people like yourself hmm. and there's people that have spreadsheets that can help you right? There's an army of pet parents out there that are well aware of this and that can take maybe somebody's recipe that they're buying from the butcher shop down the road and they can look for holes for you. So they're like, they're detectives, right? You're like an ultra detective. You have a secret power that most people don't have. And you can, you can see that stuff from a, a mile ahead. The average pet parent doesn't. So if you're a pet parent, and you don't know, contact someone like Kimberly or somebody that you know, that has a spreadsheet, somebody that can help you Determine if your food's balanced or not. You shouldn't have to do that though, if you're a pet parent, because that would really suck. You should be able to rely on the person that's selling you the food to have done yeah. that work for you. So then just walk into a shop and say to the shop owner, can you please provide me the data that shows what's in your food compared to standards? Don't say, just show me the data what's in your food. You know what they're doing here in Nova Scotia? They're going online to the USDA and they're pulling out the guaranteed analysis on the back of like chicken breast that you can buy at like a grocery store and they're sticking it to the raw food bag. And they know that the average consumer doesn't even know what that means. And as long as they just see like protein and fat numbers, like, oh, this must be balanced. Don't fall for that. You want them to show you either AFCO or NRC, the standards, and then show what they have in their food. And if they can at least meet the minimum requirements for vitamin C, vitamin D, vitamin E, vitamin A, then you can sleep at night as a pet parent. So that is what I would tell you. And if the shop owner can't do that, walk away. Yeah. You got to walk I, away. I used to have a really, I mean, I still hold my, my same opinion when it comes to balance, um, because I, I see, especially now, I think so many people, um, I think because people are at home with their dogs, so many people are now online learning about raw feeding. So I get questions daily from people. I'm seeing people ask, I'm ready to switch to raw. What do I do? Um, yeah. all the time. <laughs> and, um, and just in one text, Hey, can yes, you send me a text? Exactly. exactly. And then tell me exactly what, I, aren't those the best questions? Hey, I'm thinking I mean, of switching to raw. My friend, my friend told me to message you <laughs> yep. because you would know, tell me what to do. <laughs> and I tell him, go to your local independent pet store and hear a, a list of the brands that I like and start there and then start educating. That's yourself. awesome. That's of you. the easiest that's, answer. That's awesome <laughs> of you. When it comes to balance, my thought has always been, you know, balance according to whom? Because there's exactly. so many people who have an idea of what balance is. And then on the flip side, every single dog is unique. And having four dogs, I know that what's like, I know that all of my dogs, I'm meeting all of their needs, but I have one dog that has EPI, um, exocrine pancreatic insufficiency. So he's a little bit harder than the rest because he's may not be absorbing as much as right. the other dogs. Right. So um, I have to do a little bit more work than I do with the other dogs. So it really just depends. I can't, I can't depend on one source. I really have to educate myself, which is why I invested in the um, animal diet formulator, because that helps so me smart. better understand. And like you said earlier, having a, a, just a simple spreadsheet where you can match up. I used NRC standards, shout out to destiny white. She helped me get started. And then I created a long spreadsheet that matched every single type of food that I feed my dog. So I can see what it was adding to the bowl so awesome. just to get an idea because, and you understand balance over time, right? Like, I mean, yeah. that's something because you're a 2.0 parent parent, right? But what happens when you're a casual mm -hmm. and the casual who feeds the same brand in the same bowl 
remember like we did that post like was it 2700 bowls a dog will consume or something like that of the same food his whole life there's so many people like there's there's data that's out there that shows that the the casual pet parent will go in and buy one bag same flavor never change and feed that to his dog his whole life those are the people that scare you right because then that balance over time theory is thrown out the window because they're feeding only the same bag day in and day out for the rest of the dog's life. They're not like a, an incredible person like yourself that mm. understands balance, variation, and moderation, right? It's, it's, that's like, you're so spot on. You're so spot on. It's, I think what happens is it's, it's when you become a content creator or you become a storyteller or you become a veterinarian that wants to be a content creator or whatever the case may be, whatever it is, who are you talking to? Because there's so many people on the other end of the phone, right? Yeah. Like you have people that are feeding right now and they show off their bowls and it's like rice, chicken, and carrots. And that's it. They don't, they won't waver off of it. Come hell or high water, they will die and tell you why that's the best combination in the entire world. Because mm-hmm. it's the least amount of ingredients and it doesn't develop allergies or so on and so forth. Yeah. So it's a hard conversation. Yeah, it is. It, it definitely is. And it's, it's one of those things where over the years, I've changed my mind when it comes to balance. Um, thanks to just bickering with strangers online and going back and forth, having some, some bickering, some really in-depth, yeah. great conversations yeah. um, where it is so very important. And it's because the other thing is like, yes, every dog is different. You know, the sorry, I mean, you guys have said this as far as like the source, what are we feeding? If we're feeding grass fed versus grain fed, that's going to be the difference. Where is our food coming from? What did they eat before it became our food? There's so many things that will make your head. Spin. Genetics, genetics, Kimberly, like you can, you can feed a dog. You could go right now. So here's something that's really cool. You can now measure your dog's omega-3 index, which means did my dog reach his his omega-3 index threshold, meaning did I give him the levels? Like imagine if I'm topping off a gas tank, mm-hmm. have I have I topped off my dog's DHA and EPA requirements, right? Dogs have such a high EPA and DHA requirement evolutionarily over time. You start looking at like dog scat from like 15,000 years ago, which I really have a fascination with because I'm super <laughs> weird. There's always fish in the poop whenever they find fossilized poop, right? There's always fish in there. So it's just seemed like that was kind of what they were eating like, like it was like the staple for the canine over so many years. Okay. So they have an omega-3 index genetically speaking. And this is what a lot of like, um, omega-3 experts, Mark St. Ange and, and some of these scientists that I got to sit down with. So you and I dogs aside, just you and I, you take a teaspoon of omega-3. I take a teaspoon of three, the omega-3 because of my genetics. I need more than you. I'm not even close to reaching my omega-3 index, right? Just, I'm just genetically different. Right? So now imagine dogs. Now imagine a border collie and a chihuahua and a husky, right? Mm-hmm. And a shepherd and a golden, right? Yeah. Everyone's omega-3 index is different. So what may work for one in terms of the term balance, mm-hmm. uh, one dog might need double or triple that amount because genetically speaking, they just don't absorb like the other person. Yeah. Yeah. I finally had my dog's nutrient tested several years ago just That's to awesome. see. And, yes. um, and I found, and I, I, my dog's diet was fine except they were low in, um, vitamin B and B which vitamins. I, mm-hmm. Wow. And you know, wow, that's a, for, that's a yeah. big, that's a big thing. Yeah, man. So, yes. um, you know, and so I, I now have a new appreciation of instead of focusing on just trying to find balance in some arbitrary way to actually figure out what your dog needs. And it was eye opening, and you know, and I, I credit that, and you know, fresh food, everything that I've learned over the years, for why Apollo is still doing so well. I mean, I, I I'm sure you can appreciate that. There is a sick satisfaction of when you blow a veterinarian's mind <laughs> when it comes to fresh food, you know, because I did it years ago with Scout and Zoe after they got their spay and neuter surgery because they healed in half the time that the vet was expecting. I took them in to just have them checked and the vet was just shocked. Like, wow. And he was like, keep feeding them raw then because apparently that's perfectly fine. And then now with Scout and the cancer, he immediately went into remission. He um, stayed in remission for way longer than the veterinarian expected. She actually, all of her patients at the time all of them came out of remission during treatment, except for Scout. 
And he stayed in remission four months longer because usually wow. in her experience, the second you stop treatment is when they come out of remission. Right. He stayed in remission four months longer. And the only reason why, because, you know, I'm obsessive. So I was checking his glands. And so yes. they were yes. super, and she was surprised that I could check because that I found it. It's like, here it is. He's back. He's it's back. Let's do the next step. And, and now whenever she sees him, she's just sort of like, yeah, he's, he's fine. He will. And, and that, and, 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 and that's because of you, right? Like, you know, you have always asked questions. Like what the reason why I've always admired you, right. Is because you ask so many questions and then you keep asking questions and then your statement can evolve. Like that takes us, that takes a specific strength in an individual to say, Hey, look, 2010, I wrote this blog and that's how I felt at that time. Right. Mm-hmm. Here I am 2022, 12 years later. And because there's been more research and stuff like that, I felt that way then, but here's why I feel this way now. And here's kind of the new science mm-hmm. that's come my way. I mean, that's phenomenal. First of all, you do that. Secondly, you also go over and above, right? Like, I mean, you're, you ask so many questions, like, you know, if my dog gets cancer, it's not like, okay, well, that's a very daunting, very, very daunting diagnosis for a lot of people where they fold. And I don't blame them for folding because it's like, I'm folding up. I only have a couple of days left. Let's mm-hmm. run out. Let's go to McDonald's. I'm going to buy you as many cheeseburgers as I can. And we're going to enjoy the last three days of your life. That's, I'm, not, I'm not arguing with the way that people do yeah. that. Hey, that's just one way. Then there's people like you and I who are cut from the same cloth. That'll be like, okay, what do I have to do? What am I going to alter? What information do I got to get in? How can I, how can I, delay this for as long mm-hmm. as possible. Right. So I'm not saying one approach is better than the other. I just, some people are cut from one cloth and some people are cut from the other. And then to go back to what you said about the veterinarian, like your veterinarian is your, is the person that you've assigned to be on your, like, if you want to look at it as a football team, yeah. you have coaches, that's the coach that you picked. Right. Mm-hmm. And there's some people that love their veterinarian and say, I've got the best veterinarian in the world. They're very open-minded. Um, they want to learn as much as I want to learn. Those are like the gems. Those are the ones that, you know, you're like, Oh God, I wish I had that. Then there's <laughs> ones that maybe are not so open-minded and that may, let's say food shame the individual. And I'm not saying that they all do that, right? Because yeah. it's, you also got to rely on the individual that's sharing the information. Cause sometimes a pet parent is not the most awesome person in the world and their perception of their vet. It's just because, well, they might be just a shitty human. And that's why the vet doesn't want to respond to them very well. Right. So <laughs> it really depends on that relationship, but yeah, your vet is the most important person um, or one of the most important people on your team for your dog. So you really want to have somebody on board that kind of knows what they're doing. And today with telemedicine, you can, man, you can get on a zoom call with almost any vet anywhere in the world. And you can have more than one vet. I have more than one vet. I have one vet. When I want to talk about nutrition, I have one vet. Maybe when, uh, if I want to talk about the microbiome, I have one vet for like physio and rehab. They're all incredible people and they all have special talents. And I just fit better into like a box. If you've got to put me into a box with specific vets. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's just, it's, it's a lot of fun and it, I'm just so completely grateful because he is, he's doing so good. <laughs> and, so awesome. and it's just like, I think, I feel like, you know, um, to get all woo woo when Sydney, um, developed her mangio and, you know, passed away five weeks later, I feel like she was priming me for yeah. scouts diagnosis yeah. because I, I was in that headspace, and I have to give credit to you and Karen, because the dog cancer series also got me there. Cause I, I still have that. And, um, I didn't even have to open it because it was so impactful that I already knew that first of all, this was not a, you know, a death diagnosis. It was just yeah. a cancer diagnosis. Yeah. And, um, I had a healthy dog. He didn't know, yeah. he didn't look like he had cancer. He didn't know he had cancer. So I was already ahead and I knew that, you know, it's, and it was absolutely surprisingly easy to, um, come up with a protocol for him. It's on my refrigerator. It's, it looks kind of insane. Um, I, but I have a I whole on it. protocol for him and he's, it. he's doing really good. So now I have two more questions for you. So first of all, you guys shared a graphic of blueberries <laughs> and I was just like, I don't, I, okay, guys, <laughs> doing this calculation, I'm giving my dogs, you know, I don't remember what the number was, but like 35, 45 blueberries a day. Um, and I was, my whole thing, and it wasn't, unless I missed it, 
because yeah. my first question was what about the blood sugar spike? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. is there something about yes. blueberries where yes. you can just go to town on blueberries yes. and don't yes. have that blood sugar spike? Yes, there's a <laughs> magic word. There's a very, very magic word that everybody needs to go to their library and get like, listen, so <clears throat> one of the challenges, of course, when you're talking about just food, right? Like if somebody was to call you up and say, Kimberly, I want to give my dogs apples. What's your daily recommended dose? I mean, it's, it's not easy. It's food, right? Like it's an apple. So you can contact a scientist and you can get involved. Okay. Where's going to be the threshold between diarrhea and non-diarrhea? Where's going to be the threshold between getting enough of something and not even getting enough, right? Cause you can undershoot anything quarter of a teaspoon per 10 pounds of body weight conversation over right? You're usually safe with that recommendation, quarter of a teaspoon per 10 pounds of body weight. When I used to like vlog in the days and I would talk about like specific supplements that there was no research out for that supplement. Like there's nobody. I that. still have that picture. Right. In my kitchen. Right? <laughs> right. Quarter of a teaspoon per 10 pounds of body weight. You're off the hook, right? And that doesn't work for everything, but in food like zucchini or celery or lettuce. Sure. No problem. Okay. So when it comes to blueberries, one of the challenges, I believe when, when I, and I made that meme, but it was like one blueberry per two pounds of body weight, the challenge in the blueberry, right. Is, well, what type of blueberry are we talking about? Because in Nova Scotia, we have what are called wild blueberries. It is like a staple here in America. You guys have blueberries that like that are size of apples. Like they're just <laughs> the biggest blueberries I've ever seen. We don't like, we don't have, we're not even exposed to those type of blueberries here in Nova Scotia. Right. So a wild blueberry like three or four blueberries can accumulate to one like American blueberry, right? And then you look at an Italian blueberry where people in Italy will send you blueberries. They're even smaller than the wild blueberries that people were sending me in images. It is tough when you want to go and classify a blueberry. So yes, of course, I chuck on that meme, one blueberry per two pounds of body weight, because for a 10 pound dog, that's five wild berries, like here, like blueberries in Nova Scotia. Well, if three of those equal one, that's like a blueberry and a half for a 10 pound <laughs> dog. That's not a lot of blueberry, but stay with me. What about blood sugars? This is something that's very important. Something that I didn't realize until I sat down with longevity scientists, like blueberries can like blueberries will delay the aging process. When I was talking to scientists and I was like, if you could pick one thing in the world that you would eat, or you would give to a dog, a cat, if a cat will consume it what would it be? And they were like blueberries because blueberries will actually facilitate in DNA repair, but inside a blueberry, it's so complex in longevity scientists in longevity science, 91 published studies. I posted under my blueberry mean, I don't know if you saw it, 91 <laughs> sources and references for the blueberry. Like that's how far I took it. When I was worried about blood sugar spikes, which everybody is, right? Because you think about it, you start loading up that bowl of blueberries and you're like, oh my gosh, isn't that like a lot of sugar? And then a, a scientist, a longe longevity scientist will say, anthocyanins, buddy. And I'm like, what on earth? Are <laughs> like, what the heck is that? I can't even say it, let alone what's going on there. First of all, aside from the amount of fiber, because blueberries do have a lot of fiber in it and there's a lot of moisture in a blueberry, mm -hmm. right? So if you took out the fiber and the moisture, like how much is actually left there? Put that to the side. Anthocyanins actually will inhibit digestive, digestive enzymes in your body to slow down digestion. One, anthocyanins will actually block and lower blood sugar spikes. So like the more blueberries I put in there, the more I'm blocking blood sugar spikes, especially if you consume starchy meals. So mm -hmm. scientists would say, take a bowl of kibble and then fire blueberries on top of it. And the more blueberries, that, of course, when I say the more blueberries, I'm not talking because again, somebody's <laughs> going to listen to this and be like, hundred. <laughs> well, why can't I put 5,000 blueberries on my, <laughs> to just to the rational, to the rational that are listening. When you put blueberries on top of kibble, if kibble, let's say if you're the kibble that you're feeding, let's say it's composed of 70% carbohydrates that in the way of high starches and your dog's going to get a crazy sugar spike, you put blueberries on there. The anthocyanins will actually block the blood sugar spike. Nice. And, and so a lot of people that, that like, and myself back in the olden days, when I would talk about putting like fruit on top of your bowl, the major fear would be, well, you're going to get a blood sugar spike. So if you got kibble, that's going to give you a high blood sugar spike. And then a fruit that's going to give you a high blood sugar spike. And you got a dog with cancer that's catastrophic. So don't use the blueberry. 
then I went to keto pets. And then I sat with the geniuses over at keto pets. And that's when they were talking about anthocyanins and then taro still beans, right? Like taro still bean is the hallmark anti-cancer agent that's inside the blueberry. If you look at taro still beans, polyphenols, right? Polyphenols in studies. If you did like a calorically restricted diet, which we know in science can help you live longer. If you had polyphenols to that calorically restricted diet, you live even longer than longer. So the polyphenols in the blueberry will actually enhance eight, uh, anti-aging benefits. Mm-hmm. Now, resveratrol that's inside the blueberry. That's right. The magic sauce that Jake Perry was able to create the longest lived cats in the entire world, right? He set the Guinness World Book of Records twice for the oldest cats in the world. And then according to some he, of all his rescue cats, he had like 22 cats. He said that all of them lived into their 30s. <laughs> Not my words, his. And he had a veterinarian <laughs> to back that up, apparently. Like, can you imagine that feat? According to Dr. David Sinclair, Time Magazine's 100 of the most influential scientists on the planet, Harvard University geneticist, brilliant man. You have something in your body called NAD that you produces either when you're calorically restricting, when you're exercising, when you're stressed. NAD, if you imagine uh, an ambulance that has to go around in your body repairing damaged DNA, NAD would be the gasoline, Right. And so the sirtuins, those cells of the little ambulance drivers that go and repair damaged DNA. You got to keep putting gas in that damn ambulance or it won't make its way to go repair damaged DNA. According to longevity scientists, blueberries, right? The resveratrol, they said, according to Dr. David Sinclair, is the gas pedal to the ambulance. So you got the ambulance, you got the NAD, the gas in the ambulance, and now you want to get to that location as quick as you can to repair damage. Resveratrol is the gas pedal. So there's so many hacks from blueberries. Like, I mean, they were giving blueberries to so many different mammals and across the board, all mammals that were fed blueberries live longer. Okay. It is like the magic sauce, but to answer your blood sugar question was such an awesome question, Kimberly. It's such a great question. Anthocyanins will actually inhibit digestive enzymes to slow down digestion and block the spike of blood sugars. See, this is why we need to be having these conversations because it's like when we walk away with what we know, that's yeah. what, in, you know, slows us down and stops us. It's, it's bite-sized memes, up. right? Bite-sized memes are dangerous and they're advantageous and they're dangerous. Like, here's the thing. Today, we live in a culture, in a world that they want the information as fast as possible. Mm-hmm. I don't want to watch a one-hour podcast. I don't care what you say. I don't have an hour to give you. Those are usually the casuals. The ones that really want the information will hang on for an hour and say, this is awesome information. I brought out my notepad, Kimberly. I got my cup of, cup of coffee. I watched you and Rodney talk and I took down all of these notes. Those are the majority of the people that we're usually talking to, but you'd want to try to inspire those other mm-hmm. people who used to be me, by the way, like yeah. if you didn't inspire me, right? Like, remember I told you, I used to watch your videos that inspired <laughs> me back in the day on YouTube when I watched to learn about animal science, right? See, that's the dogs giving you a shout out. Yeah. So that sure. is awesome because yeah, I mean, when it comes to, it's funny. Cause it's like, I, I find that there's two different types of people that I encounter when it comes to these type of memes, there are the memes. There are people who like me, who are like, well, that's interesting. Now I have five more questions and just keep yeah. digging, digging, digging. Yeah, and then yeah, there are yeah. people that take the meme as fact. That's as yes. far as they're going to go. Yes. And this is what I'm going to do. And yes. that's when I see people get super overwhelmed because then you have the people like thinking of the memes that you've put out over the past year, a person who has a 70 pound dog, who's trying to add 35 blueberries to the diet on a daily basis, who's trying to find the light yeah. bulbs to change out all the light bulbs yeah. in the house. Yeah. I mean, who's looking yeah. at their water bowl and trying to get yeah. the exact right water. It's like, I hate you, Rodney. I hate you. I, I, hate, I, hate, I hate your face. <laughs> And I hate all your memes and I hate everything that you post. You know, that's the thing about, that's the thing about like when you're curious, right? Like we're all curious, content creator, all of us, we're all curious, you're scientists, right? It's all about curiosity. And for me, there's never enough information that I can get. Do I implement everything in my day-to-day life? No. Do I try to implement as much as I can? Yes. Right. So I'm, I'm one of those people that thank you for the information. I've got it. I've got it stored in my brain. I appreciate you. So I subscribe to your page. Like I have my longevity heroes. I don't take it all in and I don't try to implement everything because then you're not going to enjoy your life. Right. Yeah. But if it's, it's not knowing that's the part that's hard for me. And I've always lived under the premise of, you know, I wish I knew then what I know now. Right? Yeah. And so I, I, I appreciate that information from these longevity scientists and we're watching people like, go back to light bulbs. When you watch companies like Apple and NASA and people actually changing their technologies behind it. I mean, it's pretty, 
it's interesting to see that research is you know, affecting these big, massive global companies that are also making changes. But yes, you're right. When you start to look through all of these memes that we create, every meme that that's ever come out that we've tried to inspire somebody with information is talking to a specific or a certain group of people that didn't know. Yeah. Yeah. And the thing about it is I, I always try to remind people that it's not about trying to tackle every single thing on the planet. It's about like, for instance, me a few years ago, I can't do anything when it comes to the circadian rhythm. That's too hard. I I'm working, I'm gone too long for me to fit my dog's diet, but I can add blueberries or I can change my dog's water dish. And it's just one of those things where it's giving someone somewhere who can't do these things. They can at least do this. It's, it's the variety of it. And I think that's something that people forget. Yeah. Do your best and forget the rest. Saying that my last question for you is now, wait, let me make sure I get it right. So yeah. How crucial is it? Because (laughs) this is one of those questions where whenever I bring up like what I'm feeding my dog and go into yeah. very good detail, yeah. I know that I'm going to hear this from people yeah. reading it. And it's just sort of like, cause I do feed organic. I do feed grass fed. However, I also live in a rural town Me too. and I have a garden and my friends yeah. have gardens and my, yeah. I, I have friends who are homesteaders and I live around farms. So yes. this is all super easy and very affordable for me to do. But how crucial is it um, to feed organic and grass fed? And, and, you know, it's okay to say that, yes, it's very important, but, you know, for people who can't afford it and don't have access to what we have access to, yeah, yeah. like, can, is there a way that they can um, incorporate that something in their diet, dog's diet? So, I mean, it, it's an, it's an, it's an awesome question. It's of course it's a long winded question, um, you know, cause if, if somebody especially says, tell me the difference between something that's organic and not organic, or tell me the difference between something that's grass fed and not grass fed. It's a long winded answer, but let, let me say this. So this is, you know, the, I think the questions Kimberly upon organic and non-organic really depend on households, depend on household incomes, depend on how far somebody wants to talk when they want to talk about nutrition, right? Like the majority of the planet's not even organic, first and foremost. Mm-hmm. There wouldn't be enough food, I believe, according to a lot of scientists, right? Like, I know a lot of people will talk about, like, you know, food science and food philosophies and why things can't all be organic on the planet because there's just not enough on the planet. There wouldn't be enough resources and so on and so forth. I'm going to leave all that to the side. What we know is this, quite simple. It, when, I, when I wanted to feed organic, if I go and buy a carrot and it's organic, I didn't have the money to buy organic carrots because like an organic carrot literally could cost me $10 a bag versus a non-organic bag that would cost me like $1.99. I didn't have $10 to be spending, right? Versus $1.99. I wanted to give my dog carrots, couldn't afford organic carrots. So if that's where you're at, let me tell you, buying just a fresh bag of carrots versus getting your carrot from kibble, something that's ultra processed, that's no longer alive, go with the conventional bag of carrots, right? Longevity scientists will tell you that inside your body, the more diverse your gut biome is, typically the longer you live. And the only way to create diversity is to consume microbiome. I need to consume an apple to take its microbiome, a carrot, a celery. I want to get as much microbiome into my body to create diversity, right? When, you, when you're getting your carrots from a sterile bag of ultra processed food like kibble, and that's okay where you're at, there's no more microbiome left in that carrot. They have to destroy it because if it activates in that bag, it'll start to rot because the other mm-hmm. downside to microbiome is carrots are meant to decompose and go back into the soil. So the manufacturer has to kill the microbiome to avoid that process. So when you go and you buy conventional carrots for a buck 99 and you're putting them in your food, there's a million benefits that are being created from those non-organic carrots, a million right? They're apiaceous vegetables. I had no idea. I'd never had a fascination for a carrot till I sat with a scientist who talked to me about <laughs> mold issues. How, like when I tested myself, when I got, when I, you know, I did a urine, a, a urine test on myself, I sent it off to a lab. Do I have any mold exposure? My mold levels were through the roof. And one of it is most homes that we live in are there's mold in our walls, whether we can see it or we can't see it. So heavily infested homes with molds and issue foods and spores and so on and so forth. Guess what? Carrots will actually, apiaceous vegetables will bind that mold up and haul it out of the body. Nice. Organic or Mm non-organic, right? So there's a benefit there. Okay. 
Now that said, there's probably people who are on the organic side of the fence that are jumping up and down, listening to me say this and saying, <laughs> oh, you turned on us, you rotten person. Okay. So first of all, buying something organic is astronomical. And I don't care if it has a seal on the bag that says organic, or if it says spray free. You have a garden, which means your foods are technically organic because they're spray free, right? Yeah. So if I go down to my local farmer's market, I can buy all the organic spray free food I want. It doesn't have the organic seal, but it's spray free. Yes, mm -hmm. the argument could be, do you trust the farmer? So there is a little bit of trust factor that needs to be involved in there, but I believe in humanity and I believe in people. And I don't think there's people out there deceiving people purposely. So maybe some, but not a lot. <laughs> and so buying spray free is the easiest way to get into organic. Okay, so what are the advantages? All right, Dr. David Sinclair, actually going back to him said this best. There's a term what's called xenohormesis. That term xenohormesis, you ever hear that term, uh, a little bit of poison does like is good for the body. It yeah. strengthens your body. Like a little dose of some poison can only make you stronger. That term xenohormesis, there's actually a lot of science behind that. Take a blueberry, because we were just talking about blueberries. Because I was talking about carrots, uh, let's go to blueberries. The blueberry to defend itself has a natural defense system in it to ward off insects, to ward off uh, like birds or whatever is gonna come down and peck at it. It has a natural defense system, right? That natural defense system, according to scientists, when you consume that natural defense system in that blueberry, it activates your defense system within that, your body, xenohormesis, which then strengthens your defense system over time and you become stronger, your dog becomes stronger. You with me so far? Mm -hmm. Then you spray the blueberry because you want the blueberry. You've got mass agriculture. You're trying to avoid pests. You don't want dented and squashed and rotten looking blueberries. So you spray it with pesticides. The pesticide will like a force shield will protect the blueberry, but it, the defense system within that blueberry, according to scientists is not activated. If it is, it's very minimal. Then you consume that blueberry. Yes. You got the pesticides that your liver has to deal with. Okay, sure. No problem. But the defense system in there is not activated. So it doesn't technically activate the defense system in you. So you lose out on the benefits of the term xenohormesis according to these longevity scientists. So when you consume foods that are not only not sprayed, but look like they like went under the ringer, like somebody beat the hell out of your blueberry. <laughs> you know, when people open up that blueberry, it's not moldy, but it's like, oh, you look <laughs> like you've had like that guy in college that you see like 40 <laughs> years later, who's in the bar and you're like, what happened to your face? <laughs> That blueberry, according to longevity scientists, because it's so stressed out, is packed with the natural defense system that, that that compared to the nice shiny one, that the damaged one will activate more of the defense system within your body and would be more nourishing to you than consuming the not Interesting. blueberry. So yes, consuming non-sprayed foods because the defense system in those vegetables have naturally activated, which would be more beneficial to your body would be better to consume. Mm -hmm. But if you can't afford it or you have no access to spray fee, then yes, something fresh in the conventional section of your grocery store, like you, like me here in Nova Scotia, I'm lucky if 20% of the items I eat on a daily basis are organic because we just don't have access. Mm -hmm. So I'll go to the farmer's market purposely and look for spray free products. Um, eating something that's conventional that's sprayed is still way better than eating something that's ultra processed. Nine times. Seven. Awesome. I love it. Love it. That's what I got for you, dude. Thank you so yeah. much. I appreciate it. Conversation. I know it was. So Two years. I, to, I mean, I know it's crazy. Well, I'm excited. It's the world is opening back up. You know, I, my first speaking gig lecture <laughs> in New York after two years of being stuck in my basement. I don't even know what to do with myself. People are so excited about the healthy dog expo. It's like, I'm, I've, I've gotten, I probably get an email, um, at least twice a week. I just can't wait to see people. I'm going. I just can't wait to see people. I'm so excited. I just want to be able to see people. I'm going to be nervous because I'm in Canada and you're always told to stay away from people and six feet socially distancing. And <laughs> so it's going to be weird trying to be normal again, but I do look forward to human companionship again, yeah. seeing people and being close to people. I think it's going to be amazing. Yes. Well, thank you, dude. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me. I appreciate being here. <laughs>